Noah and the Flood in Prophecy. This is part of our End Time Prophecy series. We're beginning a series about prophecy in the Old Testament. The Old Testament contains much prophecy. It, of course, it points to the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. The salvation of the Spirit is realized in the first coming of Christ, and the salvation of our soul is realized in the second coming of Jesus Christ. But we see the Old Testament was actually written by the prophets. Hebrews 1, God who spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. We have to recognize that Moses and David were called prophets. Deuteronomy 34 and Hebrews 11. We see in 1 Peter 1, of which salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, search in what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. The Old Testament and the whole Bible is inspired by God. It's written by the Spirit of Christ because Jesus is the Word of God. So we're going to look in the study about the end time prophecy. To interpret prophecy, we have to remember things such as we have a sure word of prophecy. Take heed, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is in, of any private interpretation. What is a private interpretation? Private literally in the Greek means one's own. And that's what we see today. Many people just say, well, this is what that means. Or this is what, no, we compare scripture with scripture. We see continuing Second Peter 1, the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There's ultimately one author of the Bible, and that's God himself. And it the whole Bible hangs together, and that's why we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. The Holy Spirit is truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. And when we interpret prophecy, and when we interpret the Bible, we realize that prophecy is highly symbolic. We're commanded in 1 Corinthians 2.13, we compare spiritual with spiritual. Because the Word of God, Jesus' words, are spirit and their life, John 6.63. Jesus is the Word of God. And when we look at the Scripture, we look at it by precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little bit, there a little bit, Isaiah 28. That's how we interpret prophecy, and that's what we're going to do in this series. Okay, just a quick review of end-time prophetic events. Please look at our website, therockofoffense.com, uh, forward slash end dash times, and we talk about the end times. And Many people teach false prophecy. Many people don't understand the order of events and what prophecy is, and, and ultimately the beautiful simplicity of it. The church age is that millennium. There is no future millennium. The millennium is the church age. It's the salvation of God's spirit, where God's people where their spirit is saved. Right at the end of that church age, there's an apostasy, which I believe we're in now. Then there's this little season of the Great Tribulation where Satan is loosed, the Antichrist is on the scene, we have Babylon in charge of Christ, the Christian church and parachurches, the abomination of desolation, which is the worship of materialism, is in place. The and then comes after the Great Tribulation, the last day, which is Judgment Day, and it's the day of salvation of God's people. Their souls are saved to enter into the new heavens and new earth. It's a beautiful thing. We uh, Please look at the description section of this video. There's many links I have into there to these topics. And please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. So now let's move on and look at Noah's flood in prophecy. Okay, so when we look at Noah's flood, it's a beautiful picture. It's in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. But it's also prophetic of the last day. And we know that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Jesus Christ's second coming is, is unexpected by the unsaved. And the Noah's flood is used as an example of that in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Luke 17. And we'll look at these passages momentarily. But there's three main things. The Noah's flood, it highlights the unexpected nature of the last day. The last day is typified by this flood where everything's destroyed, except those who are called by faith. It's the days which are just before the last day where things appear normal, 
But Christ, we know in the New Testament, comes as a thief in the night. There's wickedness in the land. The way is corrupted. And then there's Judgment Day, that judgment of the flood. And the flood is symbolized in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 3, Genesis 6. It's a symbol of the judgment, the last day judgment. But Noah and his family, by faith, Noah moved with fear. He built the ark. People thought he was crazy for building this ark. What in the world does he need that for? But it's all pointing to salvation and faith. And we're going to look at that in Hebrews 11. And it's salvation. The Noah's Ark represents salvation, the safety that's in knowing Christ and by people of faith. So now let's look a little bit in more detail at these three things. We're going to start to look at Jesus Christ's second coming is unexpected. It's just like Noah's flood. It was unexpected and it happened quickly. This passage about Noah's flood is used in the New Testament to describe the fact that people aren't going to be aware until it's too late. The flood comes unexpectedly. Let's read Matthew 24. On that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, in, no, in those days, people were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage, all these normal things in life. They were more interested in these type of things until the day that Noah entered in the ark. And they knew not until the flood came. They saw Noah building an ark. He was a preacher of righteousness, by the way. They weren't listening. They weren't looking. They were unaware. It's just like the way the world is today. Very, very, very few people think that Christ is coming and the second coming and Judgment Day is coming soon. Most people that are deceived by false prophecy of premillennialism, they believe there's the last day it's at least a thousand years away. First, there has to be a secret rapture where they're going to be just taken away. They don't have to experience any great tribulation. But rather, the Bible teaches there's a little season of the great tribulation, then it's the last day and that's it. The millennium has already occurred. It's the church age. It was the church age. Rather, we should be looking for Christ. And we see also in Luke 17, that until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We know that that's a picture of the last day, the day of judgment, where the earth is burned up, all the wicked works and the wicked people that didn't know Christ are all burned together and God's people are all the only ones saved out of that. Okay, and we see more substantial truth for this or evidence that Jesus when he comes even though we have the Bible even though that God teaches us about the great tribulation the last day this, the, that day still comes as a thief in the night people aren't expecting it first Thessalonians 5 you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night for when they say peace and safety people will think oh everything's fine look at look at this we have a church and we sing music and everything's just fine and they're not observing and understanding the bible they say peace and safety in other words salvation then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape but you brethren are not in darkness if we carefully read the bible we love the bible we love the lord jesus christ and we study we compare scripture to scripture this day shall not overtake us as a thief. Matthew 24, 43. Know this, that if the good man of the house had known in, in, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. But today, nobody's watching. Only God's people care about his word and are comparing scripture to scripture and understanding prophecy. Most people are deceived or just don't care. Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore, how... You have received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, and the only place that we watch is in the Bible. That's where we watch. We read the Bible. We love the Word of God. I will come on you as a thief, and you shall not know at which hour I come. We as Christians are to watch. A call to watch for the second coming. Revelation 16, 15, I come as a thief, blessed or saved is he that watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and see a shame. God's people are watching. 
Romans 13, know in the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than we believe. Let's cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh. Don't follow Babylon. Don't fall, follow that church that teaches materialism and, the, and caring for the things of the world to fulfill the lust thereof. Christians are to watch. Okay. We also see the days of Noah were full of wickedness, corruption, and violence. And we're going to look at that, and we see even today those characteristics are there. Before we do that, we're briefly going to look at this passage about giants. Because these giants were in the days of Noah, in the days of, the, of what symbolizes the Great Tribulation, the time before the last day. And we're, we have a series, a mini-series, within this larger prophecy series. We're going to look at this thing about giants are very, very tall people and powerful people in the Bible. It will just be a, maybe three or four videos long. But we let's read the passage in Genesis 6. They were giants in the land in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. The sons of God come into the daughters of men as a symbolic representation for the mixing of God's people with the unsaved. It's, a, it's, the, it's the compromise, if you will. It's, not, it's, just, it's similar to Solomon, who was a righteous person, and he married all these wives from other nations and things like that. And it created this environment, and there was giants in the land in those days. They were mighty men. They were men of old, or men of renown. And there was, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and this is one of the drivers. It's this mixing of Christianity and other cultures and, and the violation of the marriage. So we're going to look at that in an upcoming mini-series. Please consider subscribing to this channel. You're not going to want to miss those videos. But for now, let's move on with the study on Noah. We see the wickedness, corruption, and violence. Genesis 6. God saw that the wickedness, wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. They were obsessed with wickedness and evil. And in the Hebrew, that word wickedness and that word evil, it's the same Hebrew word ra, ra, which is used many, many, many times in the Old Testament to describe wickedness and evil. And because of that wickedness and evil, and we see today all type of evil around us and wickedness, it just abounds in the world today, all type of bad things and evil conduct and, and just no love of God and no love of Christ and no love of one's neighbor. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy humankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. The earth or the land, literally it's the place where people are, it was corrupted before God. It, cor the word corruption points to decay because of the sin and wickedness and corruption. Even the land, it was corrupt and decayed and before God. And this land was filled with violence. And violence in that word in the Hebrew, it points to injustice. Things that weren't fair. And we see in the world, even around us today, so much injustice and so much unfairness. The wicked prevail and those who are righteous are having a hard time and they're struggling. We see injustice or violence in the land at the time of Noah. And we see that there's parallel passages to this. The, about the wickedness or the evil in Genesis 6, 5. We see, for example, in 2 Peter 2. We are reminded in that, that passage in 2 Peter 2 that God spared not the old world but saved Noah bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, the ungodly, to reserve the unjust, the unjust, no justice, the violence in the world, the ungodly, literally to be no reverence for God, no love of God, no piety, no devotion to God. And they, they were reserved that this wickedness and this evil was reserved unto judgment, the day of judgment to be punished, that's what the Noah's flood, it's a picture of the day of judgment. We see in Jude, verse 18, to execute judgment. All that are ungodly, of all their ungodly deeds which the ungodly committed. Note the emphasis on ungodly. Not pious, no devotion to God. How did, that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their ungodly lust. 
this whole world today, just like in the days of Noah, it's full, it's focused on people's lust. It's that eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and all the worldly things that one can do. It's obsessed with that. It's ungodliness. Instead of focusing on God, they were focused on materialism and, and their worldly desires. The word corruption, the word corruption, the earth was corrupt before God. Again, the word in the Hebrew points to decay. It's a gradual degradation. It's a decay. And we see the same idea in, in the New Testament. Revelation 19, verse 2. True and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore. And the great whore, Babylon. In the passage, it's talking about Babylon, which represents the false churches and parachurches that are prevalent and, and are all there in the Great Tribulation and have always been there. But in the Great Tribulation, that's the emphasis is they're led by the Antichrist. It's the Great Whore Babylon. It's the corrupt churches and parish churches, which we already see today. And what happens is that they corrupt, they decay the land. The, the land is a symbol of where people, God's people are. It's decayed, it's corrupted because of all the wickedness and the spiritual fornication of Babylon, which is the worship of other gods. It's that worldliness and materialism that we already see in the church today. People live just like the world. Going to church and going into the world is no different. We see also in Revelation 9, 21, neither repented they of their murders, their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. That's what the end time, that's what the days of Noah was like, and that's what the Great Tribulation is like violence the earth was filled with violence and again violence points to injustice lawlessness not where is the law where is doing right and, and rewarding people with punishment for doing what's wrong it's hurtful we and we see that's a characteristic of the great tribulation because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold that's the way the great tribulation is and that's the way the days of noah were wickedness or violence injustice lawlessness and that word iniquity in matthew 24 is the word lawlessness it shall abound we see that same word lawlessness or iniquity in second thessalonians chapter 2 for the mystery of iniquity does already work only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way god is a restraining force but there's a day where satan is released from his prison that it's that little season after the millennium and that wicked one, which is the Antichrist, is revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Again, it's a parallel. That's the way the days of Noah were. It's wickedness. It's lawlessness. It's iniquity. And again, that wicked one is pointing to the Antichrist. Okay, so now let's let's go and look at, we've looked at the fact that, that, that the second coming of Christ in this last day is unexpected for those who are not watching. The world look, thinks that everything's just fine. And then we see this period of time before the last day, also known as the Great Tribulation, where there's wickedness and there's corruption, and there's violence. And now let's understand that Noah's flood itself comes as a type of the judgment day, which points not only to judgment on the wicked, but salvation, salvation for the righteous and righteous Noah. So let's look at the verses on that. So let's look at 2 Peter 3, which describes Judgment Day, the last day, and it links it. It links it to that the day of the Lord coming as a thief of the night, and it links it to Noah's flood itself. So let's read the passage. There shall come in the last days scoffers. And we already have today scoffers, people that just don't care. They don't care about the Bible. It's a joke. The second coming of Christ, it's considered as a joke to many people. They walk after their own lust. Again, that wickedness, that lust, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? They question it. They, they question whether Christ is coming at all because they're unbelievers. For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Everything's the same. They're not expecting it. They're in that mode of unexpecting. They, they're not watching. For this, they willingly are ignorant of. They want to be ignorant because they want to enjoy their lust right now. They're willingly ignorant that the, by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that was then was 
being overflowed with water, that's Noah's flood, perished. That world was overflowed and perished. And it's linked and it's tied to what happens at the last day. The heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's the last day, the day of fire. It's a day of destruction where the, the earth is destroyed and the, the new heavens and new earth are set up. That's what the last day is. It's salvation for God's people in the new heavens, the new earth, in new Jerusalem. And it's judgment. It's judgment for everybody else. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Again, they're unexpecting it. They're not expecting it. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall met with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That decayed away earth, that land that was decayed by people because of their wickedness, that place where God's people had to cohabitate with the, the wicked people, will be destroyed. As a reminder of the flood of, of Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, Noah's flood, it destroyed all the flesh. It's a symbol of the last day. Note Genesis 6, 6, 13. The end of all flesh has come before me. I will destroy them with the earth. It's the same thing that happens that we just looked at in 2 Peter 3. Whoever's not God's people, all the flesh will be destroyed. Even God's people will be transformed into a spiritual body. And with the land, there'll be a new heavens, new earth, because the former earth has been destroyed. I will bring a flood of waters and destroy all flesh. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I've made, I will destroy. Genesis 7, every living substance was destroyed. Only Noah only remained alive, and they were with, with him in the ark. Because that's what God's inheritance, it's his people. They were saved in the ark. And they, they're the ones that enter in. It was a symbol for those people who are of faith and who are going to enter into the new heavens and the new earth. The world perishes back to 2 Peter 3, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That, that land will perish on the last day, not with water, but with fire. 2 Peter 2, spared not the old world, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment to be punished. It's a symbol. The flood was a symbol of the last day where the earth is to perish with fire. It's also worth noting that there's other floods. Floods in general point to a picture of judgment. When we recall, for example, that Egypt... Pharaoh and his army, they perished. They were overthrown in the Red Sea. The sea divided. And that salvation God's people went through. It's a symbol of salvation. And then the floods came back and, and the floods destroyed them. Nineveh, Nahum 1.8, with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place. Again, it's, a, it's a generally a symbol of judgment. A flood is a bad thing. Even in the world we live today, a flood is a horrible thing. Water is very powerful. We see in the 70 weeks prophecy, which we've done a study on the 70 weeks prophecy. And we see after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. That's the cross, but not for himself. It's for his people. And the people, the prince that shall come, that's the people, the Antichrist, shall destroy the city, which is the church and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. The last day is with the flood. So again, a flood is often used in the Bible as a symbol of judgment. Okay, we also can't end the study without looking at salvation that occurs in Noah's Ark. All flesh was destroyed, but there is a remnant, a small group of people that were saved. And we see that back again to 2 Peter 2, God spared not the old world, but saved. And it's that word saved, the same word that is used as salvation. Saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. He was righteous. He was doing the right thing. Righteousness is the opposite of wickedness. Bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, which Noah symbolizes the godly, the people that are love God, they're following the word of God, albeit not perfectly because we all have sinned because of the flesh. But we do strive and we care about God and we, we love him and we always come back to him. 
he delivered the, ungod the godly out of temptations or trials and reserved the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. The flood, a day of punishment. But Noah was saved. Note importantly, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, by faith, and it's not Noah's faith, it's the faith that was given to him by God. By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, because faith is, this, is looking to the future. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Noah moved with fear, fear of God. And that word fear really means fear. It's knowing that God is the God of judgment. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. House there is a symbolism for God's people by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, the faith of Christ. Faith is given by God. Ephesians 2, Philippians 1, etc., etc., etc. And note, no one else but Noah and his family were saved, and that's a symbol for the family of God. It's a symbol for all of God's people. And we see that most people were looking at Noah, building an ark. They probably thought he was absolutely out of his mind. And they, they didn't know what he was doing because they had no faith. They were just living in the day. They didn't care to ask him or if they did. They didn't believe him. And we were reminded of the passage, many passages actually in the Bible, but narrow is the way to, to life and there are few that find it. It's the small flock. It's the remnant of God's people that are watching for the return of Christ. Noah found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. That means righteous. He was a righteous, just man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God and that's all a symbol or a picture of the life of a Christian. By faith, Hebrews eleven seven, Noah built the ark. Ephesians 2, 8, by grace you are saved through faith. And that faith, by the way, is not of yourselves. It is given to you because it's a gift of God. God is the one that causes us to believe because we're his elect, his chosen people. It's Genesis 7, 1, Come you and all thy house in the ark, for I have seen thee righteous before me. Genesis 7, 23, They were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. It's all a symbol of God's people, and then it's a, it's a remnant, and all the rest were judged. Just a quick summary of Noah's flood and prophecy. Keep in mind those three things. It's The flood is a type of the last day. It symbolizes Jesus Christ's second coming is unexpected. That flood, people didn't believe it. They didn't expect it, and it suddenly came. That's, that's talked about. Noah's flood is an example used in the New Testament to symbolize that truth. It's a symbol of judgment day. Floods are almost always a symbol of judgment throughout the Bible. The Noah's flood is similarly described as a judgment, but also in that judgment, there's a salvation. The ark is that protection. It's that salvation of God's people. Salvation occurs in the Noah's ark, and it's all tied to faith that they believe they actually entered into that ark because they were called by God. So we're going to look, we're going to take a little turn here. We're going to look at, because in the days of Noah, they were giants in the earth and we're going to look at this thing about giants in the bible and their symbolic or spiritual meaning please consider subscribing to this channel and thank you very much for watching this video